Hi everyone and welcome to our sixth revolutionizing healthcare session. My name is Nick Maxfield and I'll be moderating today's session. I'm joined by Mikhaila van der Schaar, who will be giving a presentation and also moderating our roundtable today. And we also have with us a, a panel of five clinicians um, who will be taking part in the roundtable. So to give you an idea of what to expect from today's session, as always, our purpose with revolutionizing healthcare is to build a shared community and develop a common language and to define and understand medical problems through the use of formalisms and map these to AI and machine learning solutions. In our previous two sessions, we had a kind of mini series on machine learning for cancer, and that's a topic we'll probably return to later in the future as well. And if you didn't see that, um, please do have a look for it on our YouTube channel or our website. But this time we'll be shifting focus to interpretability, which is obviously a major issue at the intersection between machine learning and healthcare. And it's also a topic that we'll continue with in the future. We're also shifting to a new roundtable format. Um, this is our first time doing this and we're doing it live. So please bear with us in case anything happens to go wrong and we'll try and fix any issues as soon as possible. But to break this down for you time-wise, after my introduction, we'll have a presentation by Mikhaila that she's gonna give live and that'll be about 20 minutes long. We'll then go into our round table with our five clinicians who I'll introduce in a minute, and that'll be about half an hour long. Uh, we'll then have a Q&A and a discussion on all the topics that have come up in the presentation and our round table. Um, if you do have any questions, please post them into the Zoom chat. Um, earlier is better, so we can probably get around to the questions you post earlier. Um, also, please don't try and message your questions to us individually. Please address them to everyone. Um, do let us know if you need to leave before the Q&A session and we'll read your question out in that case. We would like to limit ourselves to practicing clinicians, if at all possible, since you're our target audience. Um, we do think we should probably wrap up the session at about a uh, quarter past five UK time. So our uh, panelists for today's roundtable. Um, so we have five panelists in total. We have Alexander Gimson, who's a consultant transplant hepatologist at Cambridge University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust. We have Bing Nan Zhang, who's a hematology oncology fellow at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. We have Harpreet Sood, NHS primary care doctor and a board member at Health Education England. Um, Harpreet may have been held up and we're hoping that he can join us today, but obviously being a doctor, um, sometimes these things happen. So we hope in advance that you understand. Um, we also have Professor Henk van Witt, who's a professor in general practice at Amsterdam UMC, where he's also involved in research programs in oncology and cardiovascular diseases. And we have Martin Caderas, um, who is an associate professor and medical director in heart failure, heart transplantation, and mechanical circulatory support at UC Davis. So first, before we get started with Mihaila's presentation, um, I, there's a sort of declaration I need to make, uh, make which is kind of re related to the fact that uh, the clinicians joining us can now claim um, continuing professional development credits from the Royal College of Physicians. You can get one credit per session for participating in these sessions. But to do this, I just need to make a disclaimer that this is a non-commercial, no-fee event organized by our lab independently from our research sponsors, that we don't have any conflicts of interest, such as financial relationships that would undermine the balance, objectivity, or scientific rigor of these sessions, and that we won't use these sessions to promote products or services and any mentions of our sponsors will be strictly relevant to the session's academic content and will acknowledge sponsorship whenever such a mention is made. If you do wanna know how to claim these credits, I'll let you know at the end of the session, so please watch until then. So next up, we have a presentation on interpretability by Mihaila, who will be sort of laying the groundwork for this session, and this will form the basis of the upcoming round table. So uh, Mihaila, please go ahead. So um, I wanted to, to thank you all very much for joining me today. Uh, and I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to discuss with you machine learning interpretability and how can we turn machine learning into a tool that is useful to empower you, the clinicians. Um, as I often say, machine learning can do medicine. And I really hope that machine learning can provide though interpretable and trustworthy actionable information for you, the clinicians. And uh, the focus of the discussion today is to bring to your attention a few ideas in machine learning interpretability, which have emerged in the last couple of years and discuss with you whether these tools are suitable and they make these machine learning methods more trustworthy and interpretable and actionable for you. And if not, how should we go forward? 
to anchor several ideas, I'm going to make use of a demonstrator that I have introduced in our session on cancer in Revolutionizing Healthcare 5. I'm not going to go into the details of this demonstrator, but, I'm, but if you are interested in it, you can watch on YouTube our session dedicated to cancer. So um, I am here assuming a, a hypothetical patient, Nancy, which is a 60-year-old woman which was just diagnosed with breast cancer. At the time of her diagnosis, a variety of features, covariates, are collected about her. And on the basis of these features, we can estimate uh, the probability uh, of Nancy uh, dying from breast cancer. The way in which we are estimating this probability uh, of, of dying uh, is done using a machine learning model. Um, here I'm highlighting the predictions made by autoprognosis, which is an automated machine learning framework that we have developed in our lab for building clinical risk predictions, but any other method could have been used. And what you see when you are evaluating a method like that, you often are going to see that the predictive performance um, for the population for which this model was trained uh, often outperforms regression models. So the performance of these machine learning models in many settings may outperform regression models. However, of course, a disadvantage of machine learning models such as autoprognosis is that they are black box models. So an important question is how to turn such machine learning models into actionable intelligence for you, the clinicians. So today's discussion will be uh, focusing on machine learning models for risk predictions from cross-sectional um, static data. I'm not going to discuss uh, machine learning interpretability from imaging data or time series data. We will leave that for another discussion. Also, um, what I'm not going to talk about today is the issue of trustworthiness. Often, um, together with the predictions of a machine learning model, we can issue also confidence intervals associated with the prediction. So the machine learning model can communicate to the clinician how um, much confidence it has in that particular prediction for that particular patient. And in some settings, the fact that we issue the type of confidence estimate may be sufficient for some. But it is clear that in many settings that is not enough. Just having confident predictions may not provide the confidence to you, the clinicians, to use this particular model. We may need interpretability and explainability, which are the two concepts I'm going to discuss today. Trying to understand uh, the predictions, provided by a black box model and making them explainable. What do I mean by explainability? There are many definitions of explainability, but in this particular session, I would like to define explainability as Taylor interpretability because different users may seek different forms of understanding of these black box models. For instance, clinicians may want to interrogate the machine learning model to identify why a particular prediction of risk has been made for the patient in front of them, and on the basis of this, understand whether they should treat a particular patient, this particular patient in a specific way. The machine learning, the clinical researchers may want to interrogate these black, box bo these black boxes with another goal, that of unraveling data-induced hypotheses thereby turning the machine learning method into a discovery tool. And the patient may want to understand why this prediction was made for him or her and understand whether they can do anything to change their lifestyle to reduce their risk. There are two main ways of making machine learning interpretable. One is to use machine learning models that are interpretable by design such as regression models, decision trees, et cetera. But this type of interpretability by design may often result in a reduction in the predictive performance of this interpretable by design machine learning models. So an alternative to that is to train black box models to achieve the best possible performance and then use post hoc interpretations and explanations to explain the predictions of these black box models, turning black box models into white box models. 
And it is this type of post hoc interpretability that I'm going to focus today, and I'd like to discuss it with you. There are four modes or types of machine learning interpretability that I'm going to describe to you today. There are more, but these are the four that I chose to select to discuss with you today. The first tries to answer questions such as, where is the machine learning model looking at when issuing a particular prediction for a patient, thereby unraveling explanatory patient features? The second type of interpretability asks which similar or dissimilar patients has the machine learning model led to the same prediction, thereby um, providing what I am terming, what I'm calling similarity classification. The third type of interpretability uh, tries to ask which rules or laws has the machine learning model unraveled, providing thereby data-driven hypothesis or law discovery. In the final type of interpretability that I'm going to describe today, we can try to uh, identify transparent risk equations which the machine learning model has learned. Let us now go briefly through all of them. So in the type one interpretability, we are unraveling which patient-specific covariates, which patient-specific features has the machine learning model considered when issuing a particular prediction for the patient at hand. We can do that either identifying global feature importance, features that are important for this machine learning model for the entire population, or individualized feature importance, features that this machine learning model has considered for the patient at hand. Let me give the example, the following example. So let's go back to the virtual patient, Nancy. And for her, a prediction is made of mortality for one year. And the interpreter may be, in this case, trying to understand what are the specific features of Nancy that the model has looked at when issuing this prediction for her. And you can see in this case, it is age and year status that were the important features that have led to this prediction for Nancy. For another patient, a different type of features may be important. For instance, age, ER status, and tumor grade. One type of a machine learning model that provides such interpretations has been developed in our lab and is called Invase. Let me show to you how Invase works for uh, unraveling the predictions of autoprognosis. So we take autoprognosis, or for that matter, any machine learning model, black box machine learning model, and we try to identify individualized feature importance that the model has looked at for Nancy, thereby providing a first type of interpretability. So it looks at the various features collected about Nancy and it identifies for Nancy which features were important at different time horizons. So you see here how Invase determines for Nancy for this particular black box model, the importance of the various features. What has the machine learning model looked at when issuing this prediction? Invase is one of the many currently developed methods for type one interpretability. And many of these models provide individualized feature importance. They do post hoc interpretability. So meaning they can interrogate any already trained black box model. And um, they can provide such uh, individualized um, interpretations. One advantage of Invase and the reason we have developed it is that the Invase can discover the number of relevant features for each patient. So unlike some of the other methods that require a pre-specified fixed number of features that are important when issuing an explanation, Invase discovers that maybe for one patient it is two features that are important, while for another patient maybe a lot more features are relevant for this prediction because that patient is more complex. Let me now go to type 2 interpretability where we are uh, trying to provide an interpretability in terms of which similar patients has the machine learning model led to the same or different prediction. And I'm going to call this similarity classification. This is inspired by how clinicians at times think about themselves in their own heads when deciding a particular uh, diagnosis or risk for a patient. 
So for instance, a clinician may see a patient with a specific characteristic and symptom, and the patient's symptom may remind her of another patient she has seen several years ago with similar characteristics and symptoms. And on the basis of this, she may suspect that her current patient would have the same disease or risk for that particular disease and decides to take an action, for instance, a test. In a similar way, this type two interpretability is going to interrogate the black box model to understand the predictions made by, for Nancy by looking at the corpus of past historical patients with um, a similar characteristic and identify through this type two interpretations, similar patients that uh, are found in the corpus of historical patients. Then, um, in this type two interpretability, similar patients with similar predictions are identified, uh, as well as similar patients that have very different predictions for this particular uh, machine learning model are identified. So in this particular interpretability, we are explaining by similarity and by difference, the predictions of the black box model. In type three interpretability, we are unraveling rules and laws as learned by the machine learning model. This could be decision rules such as decision trees or possibly more complex rules such as counterfactual explanations, what if explanations. So counterfactual explanations are how a patient's variable or covariate has to change to significantly change the machine learning model's prediction. So by creating counterfactuals, we can explain individual predictions of a machine learning model. An example is shown here, where I have a variety of covariates that may uh, influence the black box prediction. Note that these do not represent true causality, but rather predicted causality associated with this black box model. They are simulating the counterfactual explanations of the machine learning prediction. And a counterfactual explanation of the machine learning prediction for a patient describes the smallest change to the patient features. In this case, for instance, let's take the example of Nancy, tumor size that changes the predefined output. So it may be that the clinician wants to interrogate the black box model and wants to understand what is the smallest change in tumor size, for instance, that may have led to a different prediction for this patient by this black box model. The fourth type of interpretability uh, is the most powerful and it's creating transparent risk equations for the machine learning models prediction. So similarly to regression models, we are going to have now a transparent risk equation. But unlike regression models, we are going to have nonlinear interactions between the different covariates. One way in which we can achieve that, we can turn black box models into transparent risk equations, what white box models has been developed in our lab in the last couple of years. And what we are using to do that is symbolic meta models. So meta models are models of models and symbolic meta models output transparent risk equation describing the predictions of the black box model. So very simply put without going into the, we are building these transparent risk equations by taking a black box model, which can be autoprognosis or um, deep neural network or any other black box model. And we are going to project it into a meta model space that is chosen by the user. So the user may decide the type of interpretation it wants to see. Then we are finding in this chosen um, interpretable space, the white box model that best approximates this black box model, thereby creating a transparent risk equation. And here is an example, for instance, of a possible transparent equation associated with the black box model. And you can see here a nonlinear interaction between the various terms. So going now back to the example I gave early on, uh, we have used these meta models to turn black box models into white box models, for instance, for breast cancer. So in a recent Nature Machine Intelligence paper, we show that autoprognosis is able to achieve improved performance as opposed to state-of-the-art technology used in the UK based on regression models 
called PREDICT. And you see here the uh, superior performance of autoprognosis. But as I mentioned before, this um, is a black box model. So we are using meta models to turn autoprognosis into a white box model, thereby achieving a transparent risk equation. And you can see here indeed uh, an example. This is just a stylized example. Please take a look at our paper if you want to see the real equations. So you can see here a nonlinear interaction between the different terms. We can then use this meta model to issue predictions and we can forget about the black box model. So we can now rely on the transparent risk equation created uh, in this way to issue predictions. And similar to regressions, we now have an equation that we can rely on, but a nonlinear one. Let me also say that type four interpretations, if we can achieve transparent risk equations through either symbolic meta models or other means, we can often provide all the other types of interpretations as well. For instance, we can use um, these transparent risk equations to uh, provide different types of interpretations. We can put as input the features of the covariates of the patient and the output as the risk and identify variable importance, similarity classification, variable interaction on hypothesis induction, thereby creating type one, two or three interpretations. We can also, um, so, so how can we do that? For instance, let me just give a few examples. We can take this um, transparent um, risk equations of the black box model, and we can do individualized level importance for a particular patient on the basis of this transparent risk equation. This provides individualized feature importance and hence type one interpretability, and even goes beyond um, type one interpretability methods such as invase, which just identify the features that are important, but not the weights of these different features for the specific individual. You can also achieve type two interpretability by um, so similarity um, prediction uh, classification by identifying uh, approximated uh, meta models for a particular woman subgroup. So you can identify for a similar subgroup of women what are the um, variables that mattered and what would one need to change to change the prediction. Finally, uh, you can also use transparent risk equations to provide type three interpretability, for instance, counterfactual explanations. So you can put as the input uh, for the transparent equation the reduced risk desired for this particular patient, and you can see what features um, may lead to a particular this particular reduction in risk, thereby identifying, for instance, modifiable, modifiable variables. Um, so I already presented uh, a few types, four different types of interpretations, and many more exist. So a question to you, the clinicians, um, is which ones to use? One way in which we can provide you a variety of interpretations at different moments in time and in different contexts is by building recommender systems. So in a similar way in which it is recommended to you a movie to watch or a product to buy, we can build recommender system using re reinforcement learning, which may recommend to you different types of interpretations depending on your preferences, your past usage of these interpretation tools, but also the current patient and the setting in which you are using this particular tool. In this way, we can hopefully turn turn um, machine learning analytics into actionable intelligence. If you want to learn more about these particular forms of interpretability, you can take a look at my Turing lecture uh, given one year ago at the Royal College of uh, Physicians here in the UK, or you can see uh, our associated material on our website from black boxes to white boxes. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, now it's time for our round table. Um, so I'm not sure that we'll be able to get Harpreet by the time we start. We'll see if he manages to make it in time um, to join us partway through. Uh, but at any rate, um, so I'm first going to share a slide that basically shows um, the first of our kind of subtopics. 
um, which Mihaila will uh, walk us through. Yeah, so I'd like now to turn um, the, um, this discussion to you, the, the, the clinicians that are joining us for this roundtable. And um, I'd like to start by uh, asking you, how, does, how do you think that interpretability in machine learning for healthcare should look like? And what types of interpretability do you need? And why do you personally need interpretability? And maybe if you allow me, I would like to start by asking this question to um, Alex. Can you can you hear me? Thank you. So um, first of all, thanks for that, Mahela, and uh, that's already given me quite a bit um, more to um, to think about. Um, so, I th for me, interpretability. Oh, and I'm talking here now about uh, to interpretability of predictive equations is about increasing the information content of, of, of that of the outcome of your prediction. As you alluded, there are at least three different roles for interpretability with respect to the clinician, with respect to a researcher, and particularly with respect to patients. Each of those will have a slightly different um, understanding of what interpretable might mean. And uh, so we might need to use your different four sorts of interpretability in different ways for each of them. So for a patient, for instance, they might want to know how the equation works for patients that are similar to them but they don't necessarily need to know exactly all the uh, particular drivers of, um, of an equation. For clinicians, you touched upon what, in my experience, with made use in trying to implement some of these, um, some previous prediction equations um, has become most important is the trustworthiness. Of, of the equation and how you engender trust um, within uh, for, for the for the clinical user. This, this becomes quite a sort of philosophical discussion, of course, as to how trust is engendered, not just about equations, but how trust is engendered um, in, in general. And, and of course, trust isn't just about openness. It's partly about that, but there are many, many other features of, of a trustworthy um, invent or a trustworthy person that is just than, than is more than just openness. So what it would also require is the important concept of, of accuracy. So most the, the, the issue of which one we have to think through is do clinicians want explainability? interpretability more than they want accuracy and what is the trade-off for a clinician between the accuracy of the prediction versus their ability to understand why it is accurate why it is for instance more accurate than their either at one end of the spectrum than their own prejudice or why it is more accurate than many other linear equations, regression equations that we have been using for, for many, many years. I think that trade-off also probably is different for different clinicians. How the, the clinician interacts with the prediction is extremely important. Some uh, people feel that accuracy is more important because they are, as it were, just wanting to be able to give their patient um, an answer. But some only feel satisfied with that if they really understand in greater depth, more interpretability, why the answer they're giving their patient um, is, is, um, is, um, is, 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 is as, as it is predicted. So those are the, some of the issues that I think we have got to think through. There's no question that fully transparent equations, as, as in your category four, is the 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 
the optimum, but I mean, I would have some very specific sort of detailed questions about um, exactly you know, the degree to which that can be accurate um, for smaller and smaller subgroups, um, for which may only contain a few patients. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and um, respond to anybody else's comments. Thank you very much, Alex. So I guess with subsequent discussion on that, thank you so much for the food for thought. Hank, would you like to please also tell us your thoughts about this question? I'm sorry, I first had to unmute myself, which is the most uh, occurring uh, mistake at the modern times, I think. Um, well, I, I saw your questions uh, in preparing this meeting, Michael, and I completely misunderstood them, to be honest, because um, I think we are we are thinking quite different on um, how to use uh, machine learning and how to use artificial intelligence in our practice. But I still can give you some answers, I think. Um, I don't think we use we we need that interpretability as much as. Uh, as you may think, because I think medicine in, the, in history did the most extraordinary things without knowing why. And I think every clinician knows the examples of, uh, of Simmelweis and his maternity fever of the smallpox uh, uh, of Jennings. Uh, you, can, you can name lots of that kind of examples where the much of the progress in medicine has been made without knowing why. Um, and in recent times, um, we don't accept that anymore. Uh, we want to have proof that something works before we start uh, administering it. So, um, and I think that the idea that we want to have proof can be reinforcement for artificial intelligence. The upcoming of uh, EBM has, uh, has learned us that if we know that there is a, a what to do, what you can do, that the only thing we have to do is to prove that it works better than something else that you can do. So I think the explanation might for a part be found in, uh, in comparisons. What happens to patients with and what happens to patients without using the machine learning models? Um, and I, I have a strong guess that machine learning will win. But then still we are not talking about individual patients. And that was what your question was about, I understand at last, because in your presentation, you looked at the gain for an individual patient. And um, that, of course, is, is something else than trying to predict the, uh, the, the, the future of groups of patients. I think an individual patient will not accept that if we try to treat them according to what a computer tells us and it goes wrong, that the clinician can't help that. So there will be, if, if I, as a clinician, administer a treatment because the computer tells me to do it and I don't understand why the computer tells me that, uh, I will not do it because I think I will fear uh, patients who come to me and tell me that I did wrong. And I don't have an answer when they come in that, uh, in that way. Um, and machine learning will not be, I think, will not be about very big issues, but will be of small differences mainly, which can make a, a great difference for an individual patient, uh, by the way. Um, so it will always be a question of uh, chances. Very, very useful feedback. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hank. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not finished yet, uh, Michaela. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Nick was pointing the next session, but yes. Um, no, please okay, continue. I will stop. Please continue. I, I please, will continue. Need to please continue. Uh, just, just one thing. I will need to, so I will need interpretability to explain my patients why I advise them to do something. If I can't give them a, a, a good reason why they should do something, I can't. Uh, uh, I can't do practice anymore because that's what we're trained to do. We are trained to to come to a treatment decision. In, uh, in a shared decision-making process. And in a shared decision pro process, I have to provide patients with arguments. Well, maybe that's, that's the most important thing for a practicing clinician, why he needs an interpretability of the model. If there's still time, I can finish my, uh, my speech. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll find out. So I'll stop here. Thank you.
uh, maybe some of your thoughts come in in the next one, which maybe. is I presented four types of interpretability. Um, and again, there are more. So my question is to you, which of these four types um, feature importance, what I called similarity classification, which is similar patients, which may have the same outcome or different outcome, um, laws or hypothesis discovery in these transparent risk equations, which of these are most useful to you? And do you need other types of interpretations in addition? And um, this time again, I'd like to ask these questions to a few of you, maybe to all of you, all, all four of you, if, if you allow me to. So maybe Nick, you can allow us all four to, to, to both Bing and Martin to be part of this. And maybe I can start by asking um, Bing whether what she thinks uh, about this. Thanks, Mahela. It's a great presentation and definitely gives me a lot to think. So um, the four types you presented, I think it's a nice way of categorizing uh, different machine learning interpretations. Um, however, I would say in my mind as a clinician, three of them are all related to this transparency issue. Um, so what features the algorithm uh, used to issue prediction or probability of certain events. So type one, two, four are, are kind of how I lump them together in my mind. Um, and what assumptions are being used if it makes you know, sense uh, in the clinician's mind. I think these are very important questions. Um, the third type, which is uh, you mentioned unraveled rules and laws, um, I think is very interesting and probably uh, even more important than a, a bit underutilized uh, in our current um, you know, machine learning in healthcare uh, situation. But it will be very helpful, I think, uh, to discover and uh, help discover the relationship and um, you know, hypothesis generating uh, the causality of underlying variables. Um, it kind of mimics how people, how humans think, which is develop hypothesis based on the evidence we see. Um, and, and it can be further tested with experiments uh, in the lab, for example, uh, and in, in clinical medicine, what we see in, in real um, kind of clinical scenarios. So we already, uh, you know, as clinicians, we already use a lot of the Bayesian theorem, uh, such as pretest probability, like load ratios, to, to estimate how likely a person, uh, you know, to have a disease based on a positive test, for example. So I think a related methodology in machine learning, uh, which I learned about recently, is the Bayesian networks. Uh, it can be very helpful in discovering such a relationship. And the other issue I just want to bring up um, uh, before stopping is, you know, the medical language, uh, not language, um, the medical knowledge changes constantly uh, as we evolve our, you know, in our understanding of the biological um, and even the genomic underpinnings of disease and, and health states. Uh, so it's, it's a very ever evolving process. You know, what features goes into a prediction model now why we use that, uh, there's an underlying biology to it. Why, why is in your breast cancer sample, ER positive, or HER2 positive is part of the algorithm is, is we have targeted therapies for those. And, uh, and this treatment has changed the natural course of a disease. Um, so as the treatments are um, evolving and our understanding evolves, these features may change as well. So just uh, wanna bring that up to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bing. Uh, Martin, if I, uh, if you allow me to ask this question to you now, what do you think about these four types of interpretabilities? Are some more useful than others? And do we need more? Yes, thank you, Mich Michaela. It's always great uh, to be able to interact with you. I think, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking um, uh, through this process is um, whether we should think about an interpretability of interpretability. So like a kind of a type five thing of, right? So it's how we use all this and how we weigh all these features depending on the problem that we have to approach, depending on the data that we have. So for example, we have problems that depends specifically of patients. We want to assign patient of a risk category, right? But then we have this issue that we have a patient where that risk changes over time. And then this is a patient that is part of a small group, right? So then it has like several 
uh, I mean, the, the, the features will play a role, right? I mean, how a uh, risk model applies to that specific patient plays also an important role. So then we can think that type one, two, three, and four, we can weight them uh, based on the problem that we are facing. Um, what is the data source that you that you have, right? And what is the context where you're doing this, right? So, I mean, I had like an, an experience of uh, changing from a, a large a medical center with a large a, set of patients, colleagues, a, um, experience, let's say that is embedded in the system, right? To a place where now I had just to start to do things by myself, right? So my interpretation, my level of confidence, how this adds to me as a clinician is different when I'm embedded in that context, when I'm in a context when I have just to make those decisions without having that experience, we have that, those, uh, uh, those uh, systems behind me that support my decision. So yeah, I think if, I, I would think of, of that, this uh, interpretability, I mean, certainly that has to be weighed and that probably interpretability of interpretability might be a concept uh, that we may think of. Thank you so much, Martin. I also remember having this discussion with you a few years back, and then you said something to me which always stick with me and I thought it was very interesting. You told me besides interpretability, I'd also like to have the uh, interpretability tell me something new, something I didn't expect, but makes sense to me. And I thought that that was very nice how you said it. And that's why I added this law discovery and unraveling new hypothesis, because you made it very clear that you want the machine learning model, not only to tell you things you know, but also teach you some things that make sense to you, but you don't know. So I thought that was very helpful. Um, Hank, if I may return to you now, what do you think about these four forms and do you need more? The first thing I would like to say is that the things you don't know are the most attractive uh, feature of uh, machine learning. Uh, that brings us further, isn't it? So that, that uh, I, I totally agree with that uh, notion. Um, and if I look at those, the, these, those four features uh, that are, are written down here, I, I think it Again, it depends on who's looking at it. As a doctor, I will need uh, explanatory uh, features because that gives me the idea that I am in control. I can, uh, for myself, I can think of what is uh, what's for the patient, what, what is the best for a patient. But those uh, features will not be the ones that the patient is waiting for to hear from me, I think. Um, I think patients are very inclined to look at uh, the, the second part of your, uh, at similar patients. Uh, a wife, which is the same age, uh, a woman of the same age as I am with, uh, with two, also two children and uh, well, things like that. I think that's always appealing to patients, similar patients. Um, so for the, <clears throat> the, the, the explanation to patients why you should do something, my preference will be the second because it gives me a, a, a very easy way of explaining why you should do something. Uh, the transport risk equations are very important. I think if you will uh, try to provide your machine learning models to doctors all over the world in different situations, uh, with different kinds of patients in different cultures and different uh, healthcare systems. Uh, because in, in those circumstances, you will have to uh, you have to be able to, to run your equations every time again and again and again, because, because they have to learn. They have to adapt themselves to different situations. And that's very important in medicine, because if I, I use my say, the same ideas as I, as I learned as a general practitioner in Holland, and I will use them in, for example, America, in the United States, they will not work over there. Because, well, the system is so different that the, the patients are very different and you probably need different, uh, uh, anyway, you, need, you need different weights. Um, that unravel rules and uh, laws. I don't know exactly what, um, what I should think of that, to be honest. I, um, you think it's the most important and I'm 
Uh, I always think you're very bright, Michaela. So I think I missed something if I say, well, I don't understand this one. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't think it's the most important. It's just oh. one way. And I think it relates to what we were discussing um, at the beginning. And you said yeah. that you may find it useful. Uh, which is identifying new things, potentially new laws, new interactions that maybe are not known. So if you like the, the new Bradford Hill criteria, I think everybody in your community has heard. And for me, it's a new finding. I discovered this Bradford Hill criteria and I thought it was fantastic. Mm. And it wouldn't be wonderful if machine learning would define some new Bradford Hill criteria. Mm -hmm. um, so discovering kind of new interactions, but... Um, yeah. Uh, to, to, uh, maybe uh, something nice to tell. We are looking for pr predictions for cancer. I told you once, and now we are trying to uh, to predict which patients will be uh, diagnosed as lung cancer in the five or six months time. So then we can refer them a few months earlier to to uh, to a specialist. And we found out, for example, that the prescription of incontinence material is quite a strong predictor. Of, uh, of, of the diagnosis of lung cancer. We didn't understand why until you start thinking and thinking. And then of course, you know why, because lung cancer provokes coughing. And do I need to say more? I don't think so, but nobody has ever thought of that act as a predictor for lung cancer. And I can tell you some more, uh, which come out of a, of a very strange uh, exercise. With, Maybe we, we can leave it moment. for the next session. Next time, yes. But this sounds very, very, very interesting. So, Alex, do you, would you like to just very briefly add anything else to, to, to these four different types of interpretabilities? And do we need anything else? And which one would you prefer? Yep. Well, I think agreeing with what's been said before, I think from the perspective of, of, of my patients, they do want to know how they relate to similar patients. And how similar they are to those patients is for them far more important usually than how accurate the predictor is in really identifying what their outcome is going to be. Um, I think that the, the explanatory factors are important more for clinicians mainly because certainly within my area um, uh, leading into transplantation they may be able to identify factors which i can intervene on which will thereby have some impact on the outcome of their transplant so the, 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 these are all different reasons why different groups of people need um, different solutions from from interpretability the most important of all, though, which is for the trustworthiness, I keep coming back to that, of, of these equations is, in my view, going to be that these equations are transparent. And, uh, you know, I'm going to just leave it for, uh, you know, for further discussion as to uh, the degree to which different clinicians favour transparency um, over accuracy. If it's an incredibly transit, you know all the factors that are involved in an equation that is still relatively inaccurate. Is that um, more important than having an equation that is much more accurate, but which you don't really understand all the full implication of all the different factors that are going into it? Thank you all so very much. Thank you. So I guess, Nick, we are going now to the next question which um, so often um, some communities believe that linear models, regression models are um, a, a, a good solution for uh, issuing um, predictions. And my question to you is um, when you see such a, a regression model being offered to you to issue predictions, do you feel that these models have a biological interpretation that supports them or not? And if there is, um, this is not the case, there is no biological uh, understanding that you can associate with these linear models, why would you trust them? The reason I'm asking this question is that by transparent risk equations, we are creating for the machine learning models also transparent equations. So I'm like, I would like to make this analogy to, to regressions to understand how you think about regression models and their biological interpretation 
and see, uh, hopefully learn from the success of such linear models um, to, to, to better in the interpretability for machine learning models. And I thought about uh, inviting for these discussions um, as, as many of you as you, you, you would like, but uh, I thought especially maybe um, uh, Bing, Hank, and Alex can maybe join us. I don't know. So um, uh, Bing, uh, what do you think about this question? Sure. Um, yeah, I think uh, linear regression models are uh, definitely very useful and have a, a level of familiarity to clinicians because uh, it's you know, a relatively simple model um, and we we can see what, you know, the association and what variables goes into the model. So there's a good level of transparency, um, but it, it doesn't provide really any causality, right? It doesn't provide any underlying insights into the biological um, underpinnings, you kind of have to, the clinicians and the researchers needs to uh, have input on, on those variables and interpret uh, if it makes sense. If you just throw in, you know, any variables available into the model, you're gonna likely get a bunch of um, diluted or noised results. Uh, you may have uh, colliders and confounders um, as, as uh, these concepts demonstrated in Julia Pearl's The Book of Why. Um, so so you know, I think it's, uh, it's a useful model, but I wouldn't you know, trust them without knowing if the variables uh, that you put in make sense. And you kind of have to design the model first to, to fit, fit the job or fit the question you're asking. So it's very, I think, individual uh, question-based. Thank you very much. Hank, if I may ask you the same question. Yes, I thought it was a, this was not the most difficult question, Michaela, to be honest. I think that that um, most most of those equations will use biological uh, are explanatory by itself because the data on which they are developed are usually um, uh, gathered for some way, some some reason. Um, and they are they are gathered by by researchers or by uh, by institutes or by doctors, and in in that way, they they don't provide any new things. So they they only they only or they they go back to what we know already, and what we know most of the time has a biological explanation. So I think that most of those those uh, uh, rules will have those uh, biological background. Although that if you start thinking, uh, what kind of rules do I know? Then I, one thing is always surprising that one of the most used variables in all equations is that did this, did this patient suffer from this before? Uh, and that of course has no, no explanation at all, uh, but it's mostly a very powerful predictor. Thank you. Um, and then you asked uh, why we trust those uh, rules. And I think that the answer for that is very simple. We trust those rules because they apply to our gut feelings. We agree with the rules, we don't trust them. And I think it's something different, but it, it, it's also something historical because we are used to act by those rules and it became rules after we thought that we should act like this most of the time. Thank you, so interesting. Alex, anything else to add? Well, I was going to say, I mean, I would agree with Hank in that, in that um, I think, I mean, people, studies have shown that, um, that, that you trust people you agree with far more than um, you trust people who don't agree with you. And the same applies to, um, to equations that give you, that give you answers that um, satisfy your own prejudices. Speaking from my experience of these um, of, of linear models to try to make predictions, particularly in the area of transplantation, the whole, the very fact that you have a normal range um, which which has both an upper and a lower limit um, Im immediately means that many of the things I want to use serum sodium for the outcome for transplantation the BMI you know the mortality goes up with both low and high parameters and so trying to derive some sort of linear descriptor from that is inherently going to be very very difficult. Thank you very much wonderful thank you all. Nick so I guess we can go to the final question that I had for our panel which is um, using interpretability in context. So as I mentioned at the very end, now that we have um, different types of interpretability and we could build, as I mentioned, recommender systems that could show different types of explainabilities in different types of situations, 
um, to what degree do you need to consider tailoring interpretability to specific types of patients? How should we use uh, this explainability? And how would or should you use a model's interpretation to explain predictions to the patients you use in different contexts? So kind of using now this tool set of interpretations, um, how would you envision using these this methods to, to build a better ecosystem for you to, to work with and, and, and provide you the intelligence you need? And again, I'd like maybe to, to ask Martin, um, Alex, I, all of you, if you would like to, to, to come in, that'll be great. Maybe Alex also. So, so Martin, maybe, can I start with you? Sure. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, one can, can see like multiple different scenarios, right? And if we want uh, from common problems that we see uh, clinically, right? I think one that is common that we have just discussed is how do we explain a patient was the risk associated with an intervention A or B? And what are uh, the, 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 the explanation for that risk, right? I mean, that's important for them uh, to, to, to understand. Um, the other thing is uh, to guide a clinician to create consensus in some way of how we apply certain rules or certain guidelines. Um, from something that is common to us is for uh, patients like we want to optimize their treatment, we need to make a decision based on uh, which is the likelihood that we're going to create an adverse event or that we're going to create a benefit on that patient. And you give the same patient to do different, two different clinicians. And, and I get that every day because I get to run with, um, with one clinician one week and the following week I do with another one. And one will say, oh, just stop everything because this patient is hypotensive, it's too high risk the same patient, the other clinician will say, okay, yes, let's just push, let's give this medication because I know this is gonna change the, um, the outcome. And then it's kind of myself that I have just to make the final decision and say, well, I mean, I'm gonna be successful. I'm gonna screw up this patient, right? Um, so having a, that input on how, a, which is the likelihood that we're gonna be successful, how is the likelihood that we are gonna uh, create a side effect for that patient. Uh, you know, just to make that uh, decision is uh, very important. So I think that comes down to on the, similar, the similarity of the patients or uh, time trajectories, right? And how this uh, influence, but also then it comes on how that patient uh, will reflect um, the corpus of patients, right? So there are patients that more unique patients that have all these different uh, variables or features that uh, add to the risk that we cannot incorporate everything together. And then uh, understanding how, success, how uh, the model performs in that setting, right? Just to make that decision, I think it's a, a way where these uh, transparency rules uh, are important as well. The other common problem is when we have um, a dynamic risk, right? Like a patient, I have a patient I run today, the patient is, um, is not too sick, I make my prediction, and then tomorrow I have just two, for example, the problem that we have discussed, you have, I need to accept an organ, right? Is this organ suitable for this patient? Um, tomorrow that might be different, and then I will have another patient, right? So all these what-if scenarios are very common for problems that have a rapid change. And I can see like, for example, settings like an intensive care unit. Today, I have a patient that is this sick. I need just to send these patients to the operating room to uh, get like a resection. And then there we have a, a major decision. Is it gonna make it through the operating room or not? And this changes every day, right? So uh, what is the risk of that uh, intervention? Uh, what is the alternative interventions that we have and for that patient in that specific moment with the risk that we have. For example, if a patient goes for, a, needs to have a colonic resection, right? 
and then we can uh, recommend okay yes do the connect resection and um a, and a close the patient or do an ostomy right it has multiple implications from a patient standpoint if you go home with an ostomy versus if you uh, do terminal um, anastomosis of the colon the patient goes with a natural way um uh, with, with with a more uh, physiologic way of um, uh, I mean of uh, having uh, their gastrointestinal tract, but if we do one or the other, the implication from the surgical procedure is very different because the risk and the consequence of that surgery will be different, right? So having all those variables, I mean the patient, the risk of the patient at that specific time and being able to predict what is going to happen next guess because what happens then is oh we didn't do we did do the ostomy i should have done something else right because it's better for the patient then we did something else and then the patient died right and um, so those are very 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 complex situations and decisions that are very meaningful from a patient standpoint and from a healthcare standpoint so um yeah so those are just some some thank examples. you thank you very much um it seems to me almost like we need to change plans and have a discussion next time to kind of go on further because it seems many questions and lots of things to discuss and lot of food for thought so so maybe we should we should consider a, a change in plans and consider next time to continue the discussion and maybe synthesize the various things you all have said and then take questions and discuss with the, with the various people in the audience. But maybe before we do that, any last minute comment? Um, and maybe again, if, I'm, if you allow me to maybe invite you again next time and continue the discussion and discuss with the audience, but any last minute uh, points about this, this context-based uh, type of interpretation? Alex or Bing or Hank? I think we're okay then. Um, oh yeah, Hanks tried to try oh. to unmute himself. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the uh, the things we didn't discuss until now, at least not extensive, is the the sequelae of your decision. Uh, by which I mean, if I uh, to to go further on the colon uh, a colorectal example, if I see a patient who might have colon cancer, then I can do two things: I can refer the patient for a coloscopy, or I can do a fit test. And that makes quite a difference for a patient, which of those two I, uh, I choose. To, well, everybody knows that in the end, the coloscopy will be the best one. Um, but I, I, I think that if in weighing what you should do, which, which two uh, methods you can, uh, you can uh, to make the choice, you have to know what uh, for a certain patient is important and to know what uh, can be the consequences of your of your acting in that circumstances and so so which which interpretability you need depends on the act that you uh, you 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 want to uh, you want to follow up on your if I if I want to make to make a fit test it's not such a big thing you know then you can you can you 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 can put your your chances in quite another uh, endpoint of your rules than when you when you go for a coloscopy. So I think what we we should consider also is the 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 the, the endpoint of your action. What can be the consequences of the actions you take? So 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 thank you for that, uh, Hank. What I would propose almost I would say probably there are many other things we didn't discuss and we should. And I see quite a lot of questions in the chat as well. So what I would propose, uh, if you allow me to both uh, to both you, the panelists and the participants, is that we make a summary of the different questions and we adjourn today and we return next time and we bring these questions and maybe other questions in the meeting and we continue the discussion and involve the participants, the other participants, and, and we can continue with these questions if, if that's okay. 
Yeah, so, um, so as, very much. as Mihaila you. said, um, I guess a sort of a, a semi-apology is in order because we did plan to do a Q&A session, um, but as we got into the actual roundtable, we, we, we certainly didn't want to cut anyone off and the discussion was going uh, so well that we wanted to really have a proper discussion on these topics. So that's, that's what we did. Um, we will take a note of all the questions that we'll ask and we will bring them up um, in one form or another in our next session. Um, and apologies for the very unintentional uh, bait and switch in that regard. Um, but before we go, I would like to tell you a little bit about our next session, which will be on April 29th at 4 p.m. UK time. Um, we will be continuing our focus on interpretability, which will allow us to integrate some of the questions and comments that we got um, in the chat just now. Um, we'll be building on this session and incorporating a lot of your views um, and in order to do this, um, we will be sending through a questionnaire um, that we will be preparing and sending via email um, in the coming days. Um, and other than that, uh, so if you are interested in claiming uh, continuing professional development credits for these sessions, uh, please just drop me an email at the email address you'll see on the screen right here. Um, just let me know which sessions you've attended um, and how you watch them, whether you watch them live or whether you watch them via YouTube, because you can also claim credits for the sessions that we've archived um, onto YouTube since December 2020. And what I'll do is then I'll send you a CPD certificate that allows you to apply via the Royal College of Physicians website. Um, and that'll include session codes so you can connect it straight through to the RCP system. Um, also, I'd just like to draw your attention very quickly to a recent bit of content we did um, highlighting our research on uh, cystic fibrosis or a lot of our projects that kind of dovetail nicely into um, cystic fibrosis related problems. Um, and in the meantime, please just let your friends and colleagues know about these sessions. We do hope to grow them and we do want to try out new formats like this and, and try and engage you and build a community as much as possible. Um, so word of mouth does go a very long way towards doing that. And lastly, I'd just like to thank all of you who have joined us today. Um, thank all of you who've, who've shared questions with us, even though we didn't manage to get to them in this particular session. Um, and of course, thank you, a huge thank you to our panelists who joined us today um, for their time and for sharing their thoughts and the benefits of their expertise. Very, very much appreciated indeed. And I do look forward to seeing you uh, next time in late April. Until then, please take care and stay safe. Um, sorry, Mihaila, go ahead. I just wanted to thank very much uh, the four panelists and I want to invite them and all of you to come next time and hopefully continue this debate now that we framed it. Hopefully we can use the next session to go to the next level and understand the various issues better. Uh, we will provide the synthesis of what has been discussed and hopefully we can move from there. So I really hope that everyone that joined us today will join us again next time. Thank you and sorry for, for changing the format. Thank you so much and see you next time. Take care. Bye.